A very good afternoon to everyone here. I am Rohil Vaidya, a research intern at the Institute of Chinese Studies and the MC for today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to another ICS Wednesday seminar. Today's seminar is on cooperate, compete, challenge, compromise, and convince the US policy towards China. Before we begin, a brief background for today's seminar. Since the end of the Obama administration, the US-China relationship has taken a turn for the worse, with the tariff war, then the fight over 5G and Chinese tech, and now fears of a shooting war over Taiwan. The Biden administration has made it clear that it views China as both an economic rival as well as a military challenger. The talk will discuss how successful the US can be in its efforts to modify Chinese behavior and the implications this holds for India. To discuss this topic, we have with us Dr. Amit Gupta, who is Senior Advisor to the Forum of Federations, Ottawa, Canada. His research interests include international security, globalization, federalism and foreign and security policy, diaspora politics, and US and popular culture. He has held visiting fellowships at the Observer Research Foundation, Strategic Studies Institute, United States Army War College, and the Cooperative Monitoring Center at Sandia National Laboratories. Dr. Gupta is the author of several books, including Global Security Watch India and Building an Arsenal, the Evolution of Regional Power Force Structures. Today's session will be chaired by Dr. Heyman Adlak. Dr. Adlakha is Vice Chairperson of and Honorary, Honorary Fellow at ICS and an Associate Professor at the Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies at JNU. Dr. Atlaka's research interests include political and foreign policy discourse in the PRC and modern Chinese literature and culture. He is also a member of the International Editorial Committee, International Society for Lucian Studies in Seoul. His articles have appeared in the China Report, The Diplomat, Japan Times, Encyclopedia of Race and Racism, among others. His co-translation of Lucian's prose poetry from Chinese to Hindi was published by the NBT in November 2019. Before I hand the session over to the chair, I would like to ask the participants to follow a few housekeeping rules. All the participants should remain muted during the presentation. Questions can be posted in the chat box during the event, or you can raise your hand during the interactive session. Once called upon, please put your hand down, unmute yourself, and ask your question in a concise manner. Please do mention your full name and affiliation while asking your question. That's all. I now hand the session over to Dr. Atla. Over to you. Thank you, Rohil. Um, and thank you, ICS, uh, for inviting me to say today's very, very uh, relevant uh, topic in which we have Professor Amit Gupta uh, to uh, speak to us. Can't hear you, Heman. Not at all? No, yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, I'm using headphones, so maybe it comes loose. Okay, am I audible now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I just repeat my earlier two sentences. Thank you, um, Rohil. Very happy uh, to be chairing this ICS webinar uh, on a very, very relevant topic. Uh, I once again welcome the speaker on my behalf. As chair, uh, I do not want to take uh, too much of the time between you and the speaker, but I'll just make one or two very small observations. And I like the, uh, the topic of today's webinar, which is five very interesting phases beginning with. Uh, Later. Hmm. Sorry, uh, Heyman, we will have to do something because uh, every two words we are missing the third, fourth, then it okay. comes back again. Uh, there is some problem, audio problem with you at your end. Okay. Uh, a continuous stream. Is it audible now? Am I audible now? It's, yes, you're audible, but then you go off. Uh, it, you know, some. I think some something comes loose or what? I don't know because suddenly we miss four or five words and then you come back again. Okay, let let, let me now speak without the. Ad. What about now? Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. I think now it's good. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you, Alpha, and sorry for this unnecessary delay. Um, I'm very thankful to ICS for inviting me to chair uh, today's webinar, which uh, I think is a very relevant topic. And as I welcome you all, 
I once again welcome Professor Amit Gupta uh, on my own behalf. As I was saying earlier, uh, I'm very uh, impressed with the title of today's webinar, which has very interesting five uh, phrases beginning with the letter P. Cooperate, compete, challenge, compromise, and convince. Uh, of course, as the title says, these are all being looked at from the US policy towards China point of view. Uh, and as that, it has been also laid down in the abstract, that the top focus is to show how successful the US can be in its efforts to modify behavior and the implications for India, modify China's behavior and the implications for India. I'm emphasizing as I read this particular line, which says that to modify China's behavior. Yes. Uh, I mean, let me give you the Chinese assessment uh, on these five words, cooperate, compete, challenge, compromise, and convince, especially in the wake of uh, flurry of visits from the US top level officials, as the Chinese put it. Just seen uh, Yellen, uh, Janet Yellen, uh, return to US uh, from a four day visit to Beijing. Keeping in mind the outcome or the uh, success, so-called success of these visits, both last month, uh, Anthony Blinken and recently Yellen, and now right now, uh, John Kerry uh, is in Beijing. Uh, I mean, the Chinese look at these five words, for example, very differently from how the US looks at them. And the Chinese do not see any scope of any further negotiations or talks with the US on these five words, except for the one which is challenge. And the Chinese say that the US uh, is continuing with its challenge to China without cooperation and without allowing China to compete and without compromise and without being able to convince China for cooperation. Therefore, the challenge becomes most important here. And it is in this context that uh, uh, a Chinese commentator recently said uh, after the Janet Yellen visit that, uh, <clears throat> that the US officials are coming in China one after the other. And of course, they start from uh, the meeting between President Biden and President Xi Jinping in Bali. And the commentator, Chinese language commentator of foreign affairs said, that when you look at these visits, what you, the impression you get is that what US is trying is through these visits and otherwise also, that US is not sending officials to Beijing to negotiate, but to dictate. And that is where the problem lies. So, uh, uh, Professor Amit Gupta is going to tell us about how US is looking at these five uh, areas of US policy towards China, which, by the way, may be interpreted by someone as that uh, it is not important what China thinks of uh, these issues or what China thinks of the US policy towards China, what is more important is where US is going to draw a line or when US is going to stop its efforts to compel China to come around or to modify its behavior. That's one way of looking at the topic. Without further ado, uh, may I hand over the floor to Professor Amit Gupta, uh, with your presentation for 35 or 40 minutes, and then we will go for it. All right. Well, thank you. Can you all hear me, or should I put up the volume a bit? The speakers are at 100%. How's that? Better? We can hear you. Sir. We can hear you. Sir. Good. All right. Well, firstly, thank you, Alka, for the invitation. I retired last year from the United States Air Force War College. And people keep insisting on putting that on my uh, 
designation, which is very embarrassing because it makes people think I'm coming from a very different perspective. But now I work on peacemaking with a Canadian NGO, which is a different story. But I've been talking about this for a while. And what made me decide that I needed to write on this is the total lack of ideas in the United States on how to deal with China. Okay. And I'll just preface this by saying one thing. You compare this with Ukraine and Russia, and you'll understand why China is so difficult. And I'll get to that in a while. So uh, let me start by pointing out so three important factors which shape the broader relationship. Number one, Kishore Mehbubani once wrote that the United States has three strategic challenges, the Middle East, Russia, and China, but it can only do one out of three. So if you want to do the Middle East, you have to compromise with the Chinese, you have to do something to placate the Russians. If you want to challenge the Russians, you have to settle the Middle East. And again, you have to compromise with the Chinese. But if you want to go after the Chinese, then you have to sit down and essentially, again, work out some kind of arrangement with Father Putin and um, bring peace in the Middle East. Now, what happens is, if you go back to George Walker Bush Jr., every president from his time has essentially tried to make China front and center as the strategic competitor. Bush, when he became president, said, China is our strategic competitor. You remember that the uh, US spy plane got forced down on Hainan Island. And if you'd asked me in April of 2001, what is going to be the big challenge for the US over the next two or three years? I would have said dealing with China. And then of course, September 11th happened. And then for the next eight years, the United States has three policy initiatives, Iraq, Iraq, and Iraq. Okay. And China essentially gets put on the back burner. Along comes Obama. And Obama first tries to have some notion of economic bipolarity. His treasury guy, Fred Bergsten, talks about this with the Chinese. It doesn't really go anywhere. So then they come up with the pivot to Asia. And the pivot to Asia, of course, is like everything in the United States. All planning for Asia has to be done through the lens of a white world order. And I'll come to that one in a second. So who becomes your great ally? The Australians. You can think of dumber policies than that, but not too many. And then along comes Trump. And just let me point out, Obama never really gets out of the Middle East. He remains caught up in it. He doesn't know how to pull out of Afghanistan and so on. Along comes Trump. And Trump essentially cuts the body and not. And I should say in the interest of full disclosure, I am a Bernie Sanders supporter, but I think Trump actually had an intelligent foreign policy. And as a friend of mine put it rather well, he said, look, Trump never started a war and he never killed any brown, black or yellow people, which is what American presidents specialize in. So you have to give him credit for that. What does Trump do? And it's very simple. He says, the Middle East is a losing proposition. We're bogged down here. You can't really change things. Let's get out. So he cuts a deal with the Taliban in Qatar which then gets implemented by Biden, but he gets a number of Arab states to have diplomatic relations with Israel. In fact, if you take every president from Jimmy Carter to Barack Obama and add up their efforts, Trump managed to get more countries to recognize the Israelis. So he changes the strategic landscape of the Middle East. Now, the American foreign policy establishment essentially hates the Russians. And there is a, I, I'm writing something on this right now. And the reason is this, it's twofold. 
half of this foreign policy establishment are cold warriors, Blinken, Biden, Lloyd Austin, uh, the evil Iyengar, Kamala Harris. I can go down the list on this. And yes, she is an Iyengar, by the way. I checked on this one. Now, having grown up with the Cold War, this is the mindset they feel comfortable in. The other thing with Russia is that there's a lazy intellectualism towards dealing with Russia, which is force on force. Russians build a tank, you build a tank. Russians invade somebody, you give them weapons. It goes down the list like that. It doesn't require a lot of thinking. And American foreign policy thinkers after 1991 could not come up with a way to make Russia into a stakeholder in the international system. And Bush thought that he'd seen Putin's soul, but then Bush was this peculiar human being who used to pray with Tony Blair. I've never heard that happen anywhere else. And people accuse Indians of being religious. He also, then along comes Obama, who says Russia is a regional power, which upsets Putin no end. Trump understands this completely and says, I really don't care what is happening in Russia. Putin's a good guy, flatters him and allows him to do what he wants to do knowing fully well that Putin really is more of a nuisance in the international system than a shaper of the international system. And Trump focuses on China. Now, what you have to remember about Trump is, Trump is not looking for a confrontation in Taiwan. Trump is looking at two things. One is to improve America's strategic posture or mil strategic military capability, if you want to put it that way. The other thing is to change the trade imbalance with the Chinese. So he slaps tariffs on the Chinese, which is very popular with his constituency. All it does is raise prices of Chinese goods in America. It doesn't lead to a production of uh, consumer items in the United States. And the other thing he does is he puts in money to modernize particular parts of the United States armed forces. And that is the strategic forces. He does things like, let's have a long range cruise missile, let's build new submarines, let's have ballistic missiles which have lower yields so they can hit hardened Chinese military targets, so on. And this becomes something which makes the military industrial complex in America very happy because they're essentially committing $490 billion over a 10 year period to bring about this nuclear modernization. So Trump is the first one out of four presidents to uh, push in that, or three presidents to push in that direction. Along comes Biden. And Biden, essentially the foreign policy is, we're going to be mean to the Russians, we're going to try and contain the Chinese. And if you like in the q and I can sort of talk a bit about why there is this need to contain the Chinese rather than compromise or collaborate. And what you see is number one, a continuation of the uh, Trump era tariffs, even though now America has high inflation and a number of Biden's economic advisors are telling him, hey, it's time to get rid of some of the tariffs if you want to win the next election. So that aspect is there. There is this push increasingly to raise Taiwan as the red flag, to talk about the commitment to Taiwan and so on, which if you're sitting in Beijing, you must be furious about. And the third thing is, and this by the way is there in most countries in the world, unfortunately, the people who make foreign policy and worse, the people who do academic analysis do not speak a word of either Russian or Chinese. And I keep telling this to people in America, the Chinese political debate doesn't take place in English. The Russian political debate doesn't take place in English. And how can an American be an expert on Russia if he doesn't speak a word of Russian? And the guy who spelled this out very clearly was Kevin Rudd. He says, what you see in the Western Alliance is a real, attempt to demonize both countries and more particularly go with worst case scenarios, prisoner's dilemma style, 
because you don't understand what the other guy is saying. So you're going with translations, you don't understand nuances. And remember, Rudd was a, is an evangelical Christian, but he's also fluent in Chinese. He was the ambassador in China for a while. So he actually knows what he's talking about. So these are the sort of the th three broad based things. Now, let me get to the cooperate compete challenge bit of it. And here's the problem for the United States. Whatever you may say about the Chinese, you need the Chinese for two things. One, the international environment. You cannot have any kind of environmental policy without the Chinese in it. The second thing, which all these people forget, is that you need the Chinese to stabilize the world economy. And this was brought out in 2008. In 2008, when the great crash took place, the Russians, who are a bit player in the world economy, there are three American states which are large, have larger economies than um, Russia, Texas, California, and Ohio. And the Russians went to the Chinese and they said, we have shares in AIG, which is America's largest insurance company, and in fact, the world's largest insurance company. You have shares in them. Let's dump the shares. We crash the American market further. Multipolarity is restored. And the Chinese just freaked. They said, I don't think you understand global economics, which the Russians really don't. And they said, if the Americans go down, we go down. So the Chinese picked up the phone and called Hanky Panky Paulson, who at that time was George Walker Bush's treasury secretary, and said to him, Hanky Panky, his real name is Henry, but in Wall Street, he's known as Hanky Panky. And they said, Hanky Panky, the Russians are proposing this. We've said no, and we want you to know this. Now tell us how can we stabilize the economy? And people tend to forget the Americans put a $700 billion stimulus into the American economy, but the Chinese put a $500 billion stimulus into the Asian economy. And that's why countries like Australia didn't go into a recession, because the Chinese were buying Australian commodities. So Asia slowed, but Asia did not collapse in the way Europe and North America did. So you need the Chinese for these things. And in real terms, nothing has changed in the last 15 years. You cannot have a stable global economic system without some kind of understanding with Beijing. The second thing, which I have no problem with, is a healthy technological competition with China. And what happens is during the Trump administration, it becomes very clear that the Chinese are moving ahead of the United States on 5G. The Chinese are moving ahead of the United States on robotics. The Chinese seem to be moving ahead on AI. So the US decides to play hardball with the Chinese on 5G. And the US starts pumping money into 5G, robotics, AI, so on. And that is really good for the world economy because if two competing powers are working that way, are trying to accelerate these technological products, the only thing that happens is the entire world benefits. Because you can then pick or choose which one you want from whom. And the US succeeded quite well on 5G, was it essentially, and I don't have to get into this with all of you because you know this quite well, uh, the US essentially blocked uh, Huawei and 5G in Europe, to some effect, if I may put it that way. The real problem has been on the challenge side, where the Biden people have essentially made South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan into serious issues. They want to militarize. And the question is, how far do you go? And the Chinese I've talked to say, look, if there is a war over the South China Sea, we lose. But the Americans need to understand one thing. Can you sustain your presence in South China Sea or East China Sea for 60 to 100 years? And if you look at Afghanistan, the answer to that is no. So they see time as being on their side, but they are worried about it. There's no doubt about this one, okay? I'll talk about the confront one because this is the one which makes me laugh. Because this is the one which the Indians have jumped on the bandwagon 
not understanding the Americans, not understanding their own capabilities. And my answer to that one is, why do I have to listen to this stuff? But let me go down to this. I've talked about the nuclear posture. There's two more things that since the Trump administration and now the Biden administration have been AUKUS and the Quad. And I'll talk a little bit about AUKUS. And in New Delhi, I was at the Observer Research Foundation yesterday, which was quite eye-opener. I didn't man uh, realize how the intellectual landscape in New Delhi has changed. But here's the thing you need to keep in mind about AUKUS. AUKUS is three white countries creating a security architecture for the Indo-Pacific, which is non-white. Now, when I was growing up, that kind of thing would have been called imperialism and colonialism. Why this is something to celebrate is beyond me. And I'll tell you about the weakness of AUKUS in a minute. The other one is the Quad. And the Indians think Quad is wonderful. Quad means we can deter China, nothing like that. First thing you've got to keep in mind about the Quad is it's not a Quad, it's a three plus one. Because Australia, Japan, and the United States have similar economic levels, similar military capabilities, and they share common technologies. So what happens? If you are a Japanese officer serving on a Japanese Aegis class vessel, and if you speak English, and as we all know with the Japanese, that's a big if, you can put them on an American boat or on a uh, Australian boat, and they would know which buttons to push. You can't do that with the Indian officers. India's technology, it's ISR, it's link communications is one generation behind these three. And while I have the greatest respect for the Indian Navy, if you put them on other people's vessels, if you try and do joint operations, you will not be able to try and get the synergy you get if you're, let's say, Australia and Japan. And this is one major flaw in this whole argument when you talk about confrontation. The other part in this whole argument about confrontation is we don't like RCEP, we don't like BRI, great. What is your alternative? And the answer is there is none. Thanks to Donald John Trump and Hillary Rodden Clinton, the United States walked out of the TPP. In the meantime, ASEAN pushed RCEP and the Chinese loved it and jumped on and India did what it always does best. We will consider this. This is very promising. Give us more time. Yes, we are interested. Sorry, no. And the ASEAN countries were really pissed with India because they gave an extra year to New Delhi. But the MEA couldn't figure out the ramifications of this. But I will show you the ramifications of RCEP in a minute. Here's the thing that all of you as Indians need to know. Serious economic policymakers in countries Australia, New Zealand, Chile. And Chile is the best performing economy in Latin America. All said, we want in on our set. And more countries are going to come in. So in essence, the Chinese have an economic framework for the Indo-Pacific region. The Americans don't. And this Indo-Pacific economic framework thing, or we'll put in $50 billion over 10 years or five years or whatever it is, I'll show you the numbers on what's going on in Asia. And then you tell me what is Biden's 50 billion and workers' rights and let's have clean air going to do compared to the money that is now starting to swish around the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, the other thing is, if you go to Washington, and it always amazes me that people in New Delhi don't get this. It is about a white world order. Look, there is no such a thing as a liberal international order. It's a white world order. As long as the white countries dominate it, it's good. And the Japanese consider themselves almost white, which is why they have so many problems with the rest of the world. By now you've realized I'm not a fan of the land of the rising sun. But here's what's interesting in this. You have AUKUS and you have the five eyes. The Five Eyes is the American intelligence sharing arrangement 
which is Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. Five white Anglo-Saxon Protestant countries. Now, logically, why aren't the Japanese and the Germans in the Five Eyes? Because they bring a lot more to the table than New Zealand. New Zealand, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is a country of four and a half million people. And as the chief of the Air Force once told me, two and a half million taxpayers. So you work out what the GDP of two and a half million taxpayers is. How is New Zealand in and Germany not in? And when Barack Obama's boys hacked into Angela Merkel's phone and got their hands caught in the cookie jar, they went and told Merkel, oh, we'll let you into the five eyes. And Merkel showed the Americans the middle finger, said, no, what we're actually worried about is how you managed to hack in so much for German precision engineering, okay? So it's a flawed arrangement. And from an Indian perspective, with all this love fest which is going on between India and the United States right now, here's a question to, that you should ask. Why is it that New Zealand, four and a half million people, which makes it smaller than South Delhi, gets more intelligence from the United States than India, the largest country in the world? Why is it that you have a lower status? And it's, my answer is the one I got with 20 years of teaching in the military and in talking to people from the State Department whose nickname is Pale, Stale and Yale. And of course, the corporation of ineffectual adolescents, figure that one out. These people think in terms of the white alliance. They do not know how to work with people who aren't just like them. Problem is, in Asia, nobody gives a damn. I mean, Alka put it really well. Alka said, stop talking about Asia as the future, it's the now. It's the largest GDP among continents. 70% of global growth is Asian. And I'll give you one personal story. I have a guy who comes and cuts my lawn twice a month. And I said, well, AI is coming. Everybody's jobs are going to change. And he says, yeah, and you know, now they have a robot that cuts lawns. So I was talking to a friend in Singapore and he said, yeah, well, what's the big deal? In Singapore in the botanic gardens, they've been cutting the lawns with robots for the last seven years. Go and see where Asia is technologically in using technology to transform lifestyles and then go to Europe, go to North America and they're lagging behind. The lagging behind on 5G, the lagging behind on using these things to make payments, and it's still credit cards, which is obsolete by all accounts. Now, if you look at that, you don't know how to address Asia. Your idea of addressing Asia is, we'll go with the Japanese, who are an aging, dying population, we'll confront the Chinese, and we look around desperately for buddies who we don't really like. And I will talk a bit about India and um, United States in a minute. The other thing that the Americans don't have a clue about, and this is the stupidity of trying to back the Russians into the corner. Globalization brought about one global market with remarkable things like SWIFT code. So I could send money from the United States to Burkina Faso or Uruguay overnight. Well, you take the SWIFT code away from the Russians, you impose economic sanctions on them, you freeze their dollar accounts. How do you expect the Russians to retaliate? And I said this a year ago in a newspaper piece, I said, people who are not talking to each other are now gonna start talking to each other. So the Iranians sell drones to the Russians and make the lives of the Ukrainians miserable. But the big thing that's coming is de-dollarization. Because the Russians and the Chinese are backing this and India is doing what it always does extremely well. Yes, 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 we are very interested. Yes, we will do this. We will consider this. We'll have 1170 committees. Oh no, we changed our mind. And keep this in mind, okay? The BRICS don't need India. India needs the BRICS. And the BRICS are expanding. And not Argentina because nobody cries for it, but serious countries like the UAE, Saudi Arabia, who are transforming economically and diplomatically, 
and even the Iranians want in on the BRICS. So do all kinds of other people. So yeah, go with this idea of we're going to go with the IMF and the traditional economic order. I don't think that one's going to happen. Okay. Uh, let me talk a bit about compromise and convince. And then I'll talk about India and the United States and China. Look, right now, there is little room for compromise because the feeling in Washington is playing hardball is good domestic politics. And playing hardball goes down well with some of the allies in Asia, most particularly the Japanese and surprisingly the South Koreans, who I think are rather short-sighted. But even there, look at what's happening. The Australians got those sub the nuclear submarines, which nobody wanted to give to the Indians. And the first thing the Australians said after inking the deal is, we want the Americans to understand we are not going to use these nuclear submarines to go all the way to Taiwan. And the reason is <clears throat> Australia-China bilateral trade is 207 billion. About 12% of all tourists in uh, Australia are Chinese, but 25% of tourist revenue is from Chinese spending. It's not Indians. And the third thing is the largest number of foreign students in Australia, and that's the second largest export, by the way, education, are Chinese. And of course, you all know about commodities. So if you are going with the hardline maximalist people in Asia, which is the Japanese and now surprisingly the South Koreans, you are not understanding what other people are saying. And I'll show you a chart in a minute, which will, or a table in a minute, which will explain what I'm saying. But some things can happen for one reason. Next year is an election year and two things are happening in the United States. Joseph Robinette Biden is increasingly unpopular because people think he's old, he's forgetting words, he falls down, he's losing his core, his chakras are off balance, if you want me to put it in yoga terms. So this guy doesn't know whether he's going to be running next year or not. Inflation is still high. And Trump is popular. This is the funny thing. He got an adverse uh, judgment on sexual assault. America doesn't care. He essentially has yet to admit that he lost the election. And for those of you who talk about American soft power, America world's greatest democracy, name one other functioning democracy with a guy who loses the elections, three years after the losing the elections, refuses to admit that he lost. Whatever you may say about Indian democracy and whatever Barack Obama may say about Indian democracy, somebody should ask Obama this. In India, it takes six hours for uh, Sonia Gandhi to say, we respect the wishes of the people. Why does it take three years and counting for your boy to not say that he lost the election? And you'll never get an answer on that one, okay? Fact is, next year's election year, and just as in India now, 90% of Punjab is getting free electricity, Trump is going to have, not Trump, sorry, Biden is going to have to bring down prices. That means you have to cut some of the tariffs with the Chinese. The other thing the Chinese want to do is investments. And again, I'll show you what they're doing with investments, which will surprise you. The Chinese also gave Link Blinken a lesson in diplomacy. Because when he had his meeting with the Chinese foreign minister, he was going on about Taiwan. And the Chinese foreign minister said, you know, you go, need to go look at those communiques you signed with us, where you say we won't interfere in each other's internal affairs. And Blinken called a halt to the meeting. The world famous State Department went running out and looked at the communique and said, oh my God, that's true. We actually did agree to this. How do you go into a meeting not having done your homework? Well, we can talk about that if you like. The other thing you've got to keep in mind is the Biden people forgot the advice of Kishore Mahbubani. They've gone into Ukraine. And keep this in mind that the Ukrainian war, the West has waged a brilliant information war. So we only get the Ukrainian side of this and stupid people like the British give you intelligence. And because the Americans love the British, 
This stuff goes around the world. And I'll give you one example. In February of 2022, the Americans, uh, the British intelligence was saying that the Russians have lost 50,000 troops. In July, that same British intelligence says they've lost 50,000 troops. Four months of hard warfare and the fatality rate has not gone up. And everybody knows these people don't know what they're talking about. It's a propaganda effort. Now things are beginning to turn in America because people are beginning to realize the Ukrainians took them for a ride. They're beginning to realize you've already spent 130 billion on Ukraine and the Ukrainians are going to lose because Father Putin, his economy is not doing badly. His factories are churning out weapons and they may have killed between 200 to 350,000 Ukrainians. Ukraine is in a demographic disaster now. And by the way, the World Bank just came out with a report saying $411 billion to rebuild Ukraine. Okay, we know the Europeans don't have the money. They are the world's moral champions. But when it comes to giving money, they're misers. So that means it's on the American taxpayer, i.e. Ahmed Gupta. And I fail to see why my tax money should go to the Ukraine. It's And 411 billion is a starting number. It's probably going to be higher than 500, 600 billion. Well, if you're going to spend that kind of money in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, what are you going to spend to compete with the Chinese in the Indo-Pacific? I think that's fairly obvious. Okay, keep this in mind. And the last thing is there's no real ability for either side to convince the other. I'll just say that on the conviction part of it, which then brings me to India and the United States and China. Look, India's problem is it has no natural allies. The Americans have Europe and Israel, the East Asians, even though they have their tensions, have quite good economic arrangements. Who are your natural allies, Bhutan? I mean, I'm sorry, that's not one which I would be counting with pride and joy. This is one region where you don't have intra-regional trade, which you do in every other part of the world. Two, the Americans have two strategic partners, Britain and Israel. Everybody else is transactional. Three, I wish in, in India, there were good defense analysts who could talk about these things. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Everybody's going and waxing eloquent over the F414 engine. That is an engine built in the 1980s. So essentially it's like buying the technology for the Maruti 800, for those of us who are old enough to remember that car. After the F-414 came the F-119 engine, which powers the F-22 stealth fighter. And now there is the F-135 engine that powers the F-35 stealth fighter. You are buying a 1980s engine to put on your aircraft. And just keep one thing in mind, any aircraft you put it on is going to be in service still another 30 to 40 years, let's say 2050. By then, the rest of the world will have on seventh generation fighter aircraft. You will be stuck in the fourth generation. Second thing I want you to keep in mind is this big agreement that you've signed on technology and access to technology and all that. Keep three things in mind there. Yeah, the Americans will give you the technology, but they'll charge you prime rates because cutting edge technology is expensive. You don't have the money. Let's be blunt about that. Look what happened with Rafael. And somebody can ask me that question if they like. Two, you have to be able to absorb that technology. And again, what happened in the case of Rafael, you couldn't build it at home because Dassault said, do you have the scientific personnel who can make a modern fighter aircraft? And the answer was India did not. And the third thing in this is, that can you put together six or seven of these modern technologies to create something bigger, better within India? And my own sense on that is no, because you don't have the manpower. And I'll give you a very simple example. In the United States today, if you get a PhD in robotics, 
there is such a shortage of those people that your starting salary is $1 million. If in the United States, there's a shortage of people with PhDs in robotics, I really want to know what the numbers of people with PhDs in robotics is in India. And what is the quality of that PhD degree? So when you talk about technology, it all sounds really good until you look at the fact you don't have the money, you can't absorb it, you don't have the educated people. And the fourth thing is a lot of this stuff will never be given to you. Face facts on that one. Why are you being given a 1980s fighter jet engine and not a 2005 fighter jet engine? Ask yourself that question. And I'll say one more thing on the Indian perspective in the United States. The US has given 70 billion to the Ukrainians. The Euro Europeans have given 60 billion to the Ukrainians. If you go to war with China, how many billion do you think the Western world is going to give you? And I'd like somebody here to throw a number at me. 130 billion, 1 trillion, 5 billion, 100 million. Which number do you think? I think you'll be lucky if you get 100 million. And I just wrote a paper on this and I said, if you want the Indians on your side, you have to hugely subsidize their militarization which you will never do. And you have to woo them. Wooing them is, yeah, we'll get you into the UN Security Council as a permanent member. Yes, we'll declare Pakistan as a terrorist state, which the US will never do. So the question is, why should India walk away from Russia? And by the way, yesterday, I had people tell me, oh, we can cut off the Russians. And I'm like, do you even know how your arsenal has been built? And I'll give a... The audience, two things here. The nuclear reactors on INS Arihant and INS Arihat, that's a Russian weapons design. That doesn't come from the United States, that doesn't come from Europe, and it certainly doesn't come from Bark. Bark had real trouble with pressure water reactors. Okay. Similarly, those rockets you use to launch your satellites, that's Russian origin. That didn't come from Ariane, the European Space Agency. It didn't come from NASA. Brahmos came from the Russians. And the Russians gave you the rocket motor technology. You couldn't build the rocket motor. And again, goes back to, yes, I want all this tech transfer. Oops, I don't know what to do with it. So somewhere there needs to be a serious debate on this which then brings China to my mind. And, uh, let me put it this way. Every time I sit on the Metro in New Delhi, two things happen. Uh, one is embarrassing, one is interesting. The embarrassing one is one or two young kids stand up and say, uncle, please sit down. And I look around and say, who's uncle? And then I realize it's me. It's uh, time passes for all men, I guess. But when you, you sit down, you look at their cell phones. And then I ask them, well, which cell phone do you use? And so on. And then I looked up the numbers. 70% of India's cell phone market is Vivo, Oppo, Redmi, and OnePlus. Go into your stores and see the white goods, the washing machines, the dryers, so on. It's Chinese. And after Galwan, there was that Hasmuk Bhai or whatever his name is from Gujarat, who threw his television out. My own feeling is that was a TV that didn't work. He had it lying in the house. He threw it out. Who in India got rid of their Chinese cell phone to go and buy an Apple or Samsung because you can't afford those? That economic link is there. Two, in this Chinese-dominated Indo-Pacific economy, you can't sit there and say, thumb my nose at the Chinese. You've got to talk to them. And three, Good luck trying to get your land back from the Chinese. That's gone. And if you talk to the Indian military, it's not talking about taking land. I've never seen one person in the Indian military say, tomorrow we're going to go and liberate Aksai Chin. And if you were saying that, I'd say, good luck. It's about defending India from a Chinese attack. And again, you have to read what the Chinese say. I have a very good friend who's a Chinese air power specialist. Uh, his name is Shaming Zhang. 
I call him the chairman, which he finally accepts as his true calling in life. So I said, Chairman, what do the Chinese want to do in India? He says, look, I mean, they're not building up forces there. They're worried about Taiwan. They know where the real trouble is. But with India, they say, this is our land. And then there is the land we claim. The land we claim is a diplomatic dispute. So Tawang is a diplomatic dispute. This idea that the Chinese military is coming down all the way to Tripura isn't happening. What they claim, though, is a different issue. I asked them, what is the military strategy? And he sent me the stuff, and it's very simple. We will, ex we will expend maximum casualties on Indian personnel and maximum damage on Indian infrastructure. And you look at what they have. They have spent the last 30 years building a military, which is high technology war in local conditions. They have GPS guided artillery, their missiles and their rockets are satellite guided. They can sit 200 miles in Tibet and launch on India. And they have the range and the accuracy there. The other thing you've got to keep in mind is, I read the Indian Air Force doctrine. It says we are an aerospace power. We have one dedicated satellite and you have some kind of timeshare on a second satellite. Well, when the one happened this time and the Indians came to fisticuffs with the Chinese, it was the Americans who were giving some degree of uh, satellite and uh, ISR um, stuff. So the point is you can't be an aerospace power if you're depending on somebody else for your space. Now, Dr. what- Dr. Gupta, Dr. Gupta, I'm sorry to interrupt you suddenly. And I yeah. hate to intervene here. May I request you to please uh, wind up in a couple of minutes so that we can have some question answers for half an hour? Thank Let you. me finish because I think it's more, more uh, importance. Winding up. Let me be a good Indian here. You know, let's be like this is JNU or IDSA or one of those places where nobody shuts up. I'll go for five minutes. It's a look, here's the thing you've got to remember with the Chinese. You have to keep your economic linkage. You have to say, we have a dispute on the border, but what can we do in terms of confidence building? And number three, you do not want to depend on the United States. This comes from a person who taught for 20 years in the US military. If you think that that's a loyal ally who's going to go Ukraine with you, my answer is good luck. I'm gonna end with saying two things, okay? Sharing the screen to show you guys this. These are China's largest trading partners in 2021. Can you see them? Alka? Yes, we can. can see. We can. You can, right? Now, yeah. you've been reading all this garbage about how Europe and North America are going to deal couple from China, de-risk from China. My question yesterday at the RF was 878 billion in trade with ASEAN, 827 billion in trade with the EU, 756 billion in trade with the US, 371 with the land of the rising sun. How do you decouple this kind of money? Could somebody tell me that? And Ursula van der Leyen, who's the idiot who's leading this in Europe, doesn't know what she's talking about. The smart person is Christine Lagarde. Christine Lagarde is saying very simply, nothing. The other one I want you guys to see is the next two, and then we'll finish this, okay? This one, you'll have to use your imagination because I couldn't do a screen capture as well as I could. This is Chinese FDI in Europe from 20, 2000 to 2020, the big countries where the investments took place were not Eastern Europe. It's Germany, France, Italy, and Britain after Brexit. Britain after Brexit went from 25 billion of Chinese investment to 51 billion. And let me show you what it is for 2022. In a two year or in a one year period, investment in Britain went up by $24 billion. Germany went up by about five or 6 billion. France remained more or less the same. 
just tell me, where is the American economic strategy? Where is your economic strategy? And as I told them yesterday, you have $100 billion of trade with the ASEAN countries. The Chinese have $870 billion. Who's ASEAN going to support in this one? I'll leave it at that. And now I'll take questions. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Gupta. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions coming from the floor as you have really uh, presented to us very wide range of issues and also uh, quite a few uh, fresh uh, insights. So uh, Dave, that will provoke us enough to ask you a lot of questions. So um, let me open the discussion now. Rohil? Uh, yes, so there, there don't seem to be any questions in the chat box till now, but I think people will need a little time to uh, kind of digest and come up with something. So, okay, uh, so in that case, let me use my privilege as the chair and uh, I will begin with one or two uh, points. I'll reiterate what I had said in the beginning in my opening remark. Uh, as uh, I think we've, uh, we've Still, uh, you have not satisfied our appetite, uh, Professor Gupta, about uh, what you mentioned in the abstract, that, uh, how much efforts or how long the U.S. is going to put in efforts to uh, compel China to modify its behavior vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. That is one. And second, in the current assessment, uh, in the official assessment, AT, as also in the academic debates and discourse, there is a general impression that uh, the U.S. is not going to let up or U.S. is not going to give China a breathing space. And U.S. is not even allowing, going to allow China to compete with the U.S. That, that is the assessment in Beijing. So in that situation, uh, what, what does one do? I mean, it's a, it's almost coming down to now a choice between, as they say, uh, the guns and butter, as far as China is concerned. So, what is your view on? You want me to take one more question, or just go one by one? I think you may begin uh, answering these two questions, and in the meantime, then we will have more questions coming up from the floor. No. The Biden people and the Trump people do not see any point in breathing space because they see this as an existential economic challenge. And remember one thing, China is not Russia. Russia, as I pointed out earlier, is very easy to counter. You don't know how to counter the Chinese. And what you come up with are these lofty ideas that nobody wants, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, We'll all worry about the environment and workers' rights in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Bangladesh. Remember when the building came down and killed 1,300 people in Bangladesh? These people aren't looking at that. They are looking at, if you want to have an economic framework with us, give us access to the U.S. market, which won't happen. Okay, so the Chinese look a better option. And don't go into the well, the Belt and Road, look what happened to Sri Lanka, look what happened to Pakistan. It'll keep growing. Trade will not go down. The Chinese trade in Asia with ASEAN will go over a trillion dollars in the next five years. That has a logic in its own. Chinese trade with the EU will go up to 900 billion or more despite decoupling and all de-risking and all these other words that um, seem to be very fashionable amongst analysts in New Delhi. The fact of the matter is the Chinese have not yet begun doing things in the Mediterranean and in Eastern Europe. When they start doing that, watch the fun. When they took the Greek port of Piraeus, they said, we will make it bigger than Rotterdam. Rotterdam is the biggest port in Europe in actual terms. And they can do it. 
because I always say this in the United States, the Chinese have ambition, vision, and resources. You don't. I mean, keep one more thing in mind, but you know about breathing space? Did anybody notice that the Australians who were second on my list of people who talk big and produce very little, just canceled the Commonwealth Games of 2026 in Melbourne because it was too expensive. Have you noticed what is happening in the continent of the now? The Saudis are buying out American golf. They want to buy out global tennis. They want to buy out global women's tennis. India is running global cricket. These countries are creating breathing space. And if de-dollarization happens, even if it's 10%, watch the fun. So this is out of the hands of Washington. And the more bellicose you get, it's not phasing the Chinese. Keep one thing in mind about the Chinese guys. The Chinese don't are not scared of taking a fight with a superior force. They've done it before with the Americans. They're willing to do it now. The question is, who'll blink? And the, the other thing on modifying behavior is, your modification of behavior is that the Chinese essentially take a situation or take a position which puts them in a permanent lower status. They don't need to be there. I put it that way. There's one in the chat box. Uh, yes, sir. So, um, uh, Akim Rahman asks, do you really believe that countries like ASEAN or Japan will consider only the economic dimension? And if that's an overemphasization of the economic uh, side of things, because they believe that the economy may take a backseat if China becomes an existential threat to nations like ASEAN and Japan. Okay. Yeah. Look, India is fascinated with the Japanese. Nobody else is. Japan is a country of about 120 million people, which by 2050 goes down to 106 million old people. If you travel through Northern Japan, like I have, there are villages with the median population, the median age of the population is 70. It's that bad. And these villages are deserted. The average Japanese woman, if you're lucky, has one child. What are they going to fight with? This... Yeah, they're upset with the Chinese, they're building submarines, and everybody hopes that the Americans will go to war with China. And I'll go to why I think it's less likely now than it would have been three years ago in a second. So keep this in mind about the Japanese. If that is the only country that you think is worth uh, bandwagoning with against the Chinese, my answer there is that's extremely short-sighted. ASEAN is about money. ASEAN is about money. And you talk to the American diplomats who look at the South China Sea and so on. They say all the countries have taken all the islands they could. Now, the only way to solve this is diplomacy. Because for the Filipinos to go to war with China is not on. For the Vietnamese to go to war with China is not on. And the Chinese are not going to go below the nine dash line to take something in Indonesia. Whatever they may say in terms of rhetoric, the reality is something different. ASEAN is about money. ASEAN would not have come up with RCEP otherwise. Okay, So do keep that part of this in mind. And on the uh, American side, my, my sense is very clearly this, Ukraine, is an absolute disaster because you're now stuck paying for this. And the Mahbubani effect has come back in. Instead of focusing on China, you're focusing on China and on Russia. And the Russians are very good at asymmetric warfare. So anybody here think that you're gonna win that one with uh, this kind of thing of not giving breathing space, we'll talk tough, what about the Uyghurs? Uh, good luck. So, um, Kamam has been has a hand raised for a while. Uh, Kamam, would you like to come in? Yeah, sure. So, um, thanks, Amit, uh, 
for uh, as provocative and as uh, uh, pugnacious a talk as ever. Uh, so let me start with the point you made that uh, there is a total lack, sorry, there's a, a total lack of ideas uh, when it comes to China and the US. Now, uh, one reflection of this state of affairs is their strategic discourse, which continues to really put the, uh, put, put the Chinese into this uh, emerging existential threat, uh, emerging uh, you know, the, the, the new kind of uh, challenge to the world uh, and the world order and so on. And uh, on the other hand, so, so this is the, about the American discourse, but you know, I mean, we've been looking at the Chinese uh, writings also, and we're trying to follow their debates. Uh, they too seem to think that now this is about ultimately about the Chinese versus the US. India is of course caught in between and uh, I won't go into that for, a, for now, but uh, I'm trying to look at uh, the Americans are sending people, they are trying to negotiate, they are trying to talk and yet the discourse is only and only about this, you know, that, that almost like a foregone conclusion that we are heading towards, towards war. That's what's really... Where, where is the, the, you know, the possibility of any kind of via media here? Uh, if it's not going to come from the American establishment, if it's not going to come from the scholars, are you therefore then saying it is a doomed scenario that we are looking at, at an inevitable clash? Because that then really queers the pitch for India. Sure. sure. It, let, let me say this. The relations went as bad as they could. Now, all of a sudden, Janet Yellen is going to Beijing. When your treasury secretary goes to Beijing, it's about compromise. When your defense secretary goes to Beijing and your foreign secretary goes to Beijing, it's about the poor little Uyghurs and the poor oppressed Tibetans and everything else, okay? And your de defense secretary goes, it's about, well, your missiles are now hitting the second island chain. So we're sending the Marines to Darwin, just whatever. No, Yellen went because they know they need the Chinese for certain things. And the Biden people are also beginning to understand one thing, that they made a mess of Russia. And keep one thing in mind on Russia because your European studies department in JNU, the less said, the better. But somebody there should be able to say this. The danger for NATO is it's doing what happened in World War I, where the Austrian Archduke Ferdinand, the bastard child of the emperor, was killed by the Serbs. And the Austrians made 40 demands. The Serbs, who I happen to like, uh, my co-author is a Serb, uh, agreed to 38. And they said, we don't reject the other two. We would just like to talk about them. And the Austrians said, no, if you don't take all 40, it's war. Now, the reason they said that was because they had big brother Germany behind them. And if the Austrians went to war, the Germans by treaty had to go to war. Look at what is happening now. There are two supreme crazy people in NATO, the Lithuanians and the Poles, and they want to go for the Russians, quite forgetting their own history that every time they've done that, Father Zhukov and Father Putin may make life very miserable for them. Okay, And this is now beginning to scare people like the Germans, the French, and even the Biden people, that do we want to be dragged into a shooting war with the Russians because of this? And what does it do on the China front? So they really need to sit and talk about this. The other problem is that de-dollarization, and right now it's only symbolic, okay? This idea that we're all going to switch to Yuan or uh, Malaysian ringgit, that's going to take decades. But merely the threat of this is going to create a different kind of situation. But to answer your question, Alka, let me put it this way. The wiser voices in American academia now are not talking on China. The, the kinds who would have said, 
negotiate, compromise, convince. Everybody's laying low because the national agenda has changed. And on the Chinese side, it's changed too. Let, let's not make the Chinese any less uh, culpable in this one. So the only way that this can change is if there's a serious economic crisis in the United States. Otherwise, right now what it's doing is it's allowing remilitarization. Problem with remilitarization is this. At some stage, it bankrupts you. And I'll just end by saying one thing which nobody in America seems to be writing about. The American defense budget is 820 billion. The American pensions and veterans medical budget is 328 billion. So it's already 1.1 trillion. In India, you lump both together and get 2.1% of GDP. In America, if you put both of these together, that number is unsustainable. And it's become so ridiculous now, the men in this audience will laugh and the married women will laugh harder. Uh, if you are a US retired military personnel, you can claim sleep apnea, which is the fancy word for snoring. And as I told one of my students, I said, your husband snores, so he can claim sleep apnea, and you can claim the emotional distress of having to sleep next to him. So you should get two pension bear jumps for that. This is how ridiculous it's become in America. The national security bureaucracy is driving a crazy thing, and the Chinese are playing the game differently. And keep one thing also on the other side of the table. I don't think the U.S. can take the kind of casualties the Chinese can. I'll leave it at that. Um, Vice Admiral Murli Garan has had his hand raised. So would you like to come in? Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That's a very, you've given a total different perspective. Uh, what I have, uh, I have a comment to make and then I'll ask you a question. Basically, my question is in hindsight, uh, did the Nixon Kissinger uh, group do a big damage to US and world by encouraging Chinese at that stage to counter the Soviet Union? And um, secondly, of course, as you rightly said, a naval war, now the Chinese PLA Navy has developed so much and probably they have more number of operational units than the Americans. They may not have that kind of you know, quantity of high tech ships as of now, but the way they're developing nuclear submarines and destroyers and frigates with longer reaches, it will no more be a cakewalk even if somebody wants to support Taiwan in a war. Uh, that's a very valid point that you've made. And um, lastly, some time ago, I, uh, you know, uh, one of our very senior diplomats, Ambassador Ghare Khan, had talked about this, uh, quoting Mrs. Gandhi, saying that she said, you know, we may befriend Pakistan uh, couple of decades from now, but China is a nation we can never trust. What is your view on this? Both okay. these aspects. Uh, firstly, thank you for the historical question. Okay. I, I, one of my really good friends is the Australian Hugh White. And Hugh White made the point, which I think was, he said, 72, Nixon and Mao cut the best deal, which was we recognize China, you help us get out of Southeast Asia. And the Chinese did that. And Hugh's point is, look, after that, from 1972, 73, all the way up to the early 2000s, you have peace in the Asia Pacific. And you have incredible prosperity because the Chinese and the Americans can play together. So the question is, how do you do that now? And there are all kinds of things like, well, you understand that Northeast Asia is a Chinese sphere of influence, Southeast Asia is an American sphere of influence. People have talked about it. It's like the Bismarckian deal with the British, where he said, we are a continental power. You build your navies and do rule Britannia and all the other thing, you know? Uh, that was, that is the possibility there. And only, what was the second point? Sorry, I just forgot. The uh, second point was, of course, which I mentioned about the Taiwan with the Navy building up now, they won't be able to. And the other one was Mrs. Indira Gandhi's observation that oh, you yes, would never yeah. trust. Look, 
I have a different view on this. And firstly, I'm not a North Indian. North Indians are obsessed with Pakistan, this Mujra Shairi, Kawali culture, the Khan Kapoor's in Bollywood. This is what does it to them. You remember when that Bimbo Hina Rabani Khair came to India with a Gucci handbag? Yes. Uh, the great journalist Barkadat and associate professor of Harvard, Nidhi Rasdan, were um, waxing eloquent about her. I was giving a lecture in Bangalore. So somebody asked me, what do you think of this woman? I said, look, we live very close to Chennai. And at that time, Amma was alive. Yes. And I said, we should send this bimbo down to see Amma. Because Amma will call her servants and say, Ganga Dharan, Shri Dharan, yeah. take this bimbo to bedroom number 26 and show her my 240 Gucci handbags. Okay. That is how South India looks at Pakistan. North India has this romance with Pakistan. I don't. I consider myself a West Indian. And here's the interesting part in this. Have you seen one Pakistani admiral say, I apologize for the terror attacks of December 2008? Sorry, yeah, December 2008. Not one. And all of them, we want bhaichara, you know, this West Punjabi word, which after you slap them in the face, they suddenly remember bhaichara. But the thing with these people is not one. Okay, Nawaz Sharif who wants peace with India, uh, Zardari who wants peace with India, his obese son Bilawal Bhutto who wants peace with India. We, and of course, Imran Khan, who Monday, Wednesday, Friday wants peace with India. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm not sure what goes on in his mind. You know, maybe you should get off sexting. That might help him in his life. But the point is not one of these people has ever apologized. Okay. And keep, we as Indians should keep one thing in mind. The Chinese don't carry out terror attacks in New Delhi and Mumbai. That is done by India's friendly neighbor to the West. And India panders to these people in a way it never would to a Chinese leader. So my take is this. You have an ideological dispute with the Chinese. You have a territorial dispute, which the Indian government will never open up the files so we can see what actually happened. But I will say this to you, Admiral. There is no foreign scholar who's looked at this who supports the Indian case. Neville Maxwell doesn't support the Indian case. John Garver doesn't support the Indian case. Alistair Lamb didn't support the Indian case. Taylor Fravel doesn't support the Indian case on China. On Kashmir, a lot of people support the Indian case because they know that what the Pakistanis did was aggression. China, this whole thing, and remember this love in New Delhi for Taiwan, uh, Chiang Kai-shek never believed that uh, the border between India and China was valid. He had the same territorial claims that Mao did. So this has never changed. My, my, and, and, and I'll say this, every Indian talks about the betrayal of 1962. There aren't that many Indians alive who remember 1962. There are millions and, well, I'd say hundreds of millions of Indians alive who remember the Mumbai terror attacks. Why are you being nice to these terrorists? And why are you not talking to the Chinese? I'm not saying that you give up on your territorial disputes. I think India has a right to pursue that. But at the same time, you can be like the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Taiwanese who take joy from making money off their enemy. Look at the amount of intra-Northeast Asian trade. Are we that dumb? And I call myself an Indian right now, even though I'm an American citizen because my mother's sitting in the next room and I have to keep her happy too in this. Look, we should be able to talk to the Chinese. We should be able to open our options. And Admiral, you know this because you're a Navy man. The Navy had the smallest budget, so it had to do the best thinking on weapons acquisition and so on. You would have had real trouble if you didn't have the Russia option. So now you're sitting in New Delhi saying, get rid of the Russians. Does anybody in their right mind think 
that you're going to get an Admiral Gorshkov type aircraft carrier from the United States. No. And if you do, how many billion will it cost you? So, but you know, you can't have this discussion anymore. So uh, thank you for the question because I think the real problem is Pakistan. I don't think it's China. I think this can still be managed if you have good diplomats who start to cool things down. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your views. So uh, there's a question in the chat box from Mr. Albert. He thanks you for the informative talk and he wanted to ask your perspective on the evolution of two of the two major global powers in advancing the technologies of the future where he specifies AI and 5G. He points out two distinct ideological paradigms, namely surveillance capitalism and surveillance communism that are yeah. concurrently progressing. So he, his question is, how do you see India tackling this and how is it going to engage with these two paradigms in the coming days? Uh, well, firstly, Albert, thank you for using or coining those terms, surveillance capitalism and surveillance communism. I think they are growing by leaps and bounds, okay? There, there's no doubt about that. I think India is trying to do things like essentially telling the Googles and the Facebooks of the world that you can't keep data on Indian citizens in your countries. It has to be stored in India. This kind of thing is good. I don't think India has the wherewithal to come up with serious alternatives to TikTok and WhatsApp and, in, excuse me, Instagram and so on. And if you can't do that, you are not going to be able to kill surveillance capitalism and surveillance communism. And of course, remember, India used to make cell phones called Micromax and Lava. Now you don't. It's all Chinese. So in one sense, it's, it's a losing struggle for India, but it's a serious one. And I, I would be interested in hearing what other people had to say about that. Uh, so, so I had a question of my own. Oh, before that, um, Avinash Godbole has a question. He thanks you for your talk and he asks for your opinion on why China took the aggressive steps that it did in the summer of 2020 that led to the Galvan dispute. Avinash Gurbole, my fellow Marathi, uh, this is what you have to keep in mind. The Chinese felt India was encroaching on their land, not on the land they claimed, their land. And remember, Penang was the geo northern command when the Chinese settled in firmly on that land. The other thing is, look, I'm, I'm going to put this differently because I, I want to be kind here rather than be abrasive and pugnacious. The Chinese are the world's largest authoritarian nation. India is the world's largest democracy. The Chinese gave a better account of Galwan than India did of Galwan. They lined up the bodies of the number of Indian troops. They were the ones who came out of the video. And you see the Indian troops in the video there with riot shields, batons, and helmets. That's not that you went unprepared for a fight. You went well prepared for a fight. So do keep that part of it in mind. What disappoints me is that India's publicity machine could not provide a counter. It could not show what the Chinese were doing. So around the world, there was only one narrative about this. The Chinese will tell you that we did a defensive maneuver, but then they have 6,000 years of defensive maneuvers, which we should all take with a pinch of salt. Right. Uh, thank you, sir. So my question really is, you seem to be suggesting that there is an inevitable sort of bipolarity that's developing and that there seems to be, um, you know, this, this, uh, irrationality in trying to defend against it. So will the biggest takeaway for the academic and policy community be to generate more kind of knowledge on engaging more fruitfully with China than kind of parroting these narratives or these re this rhetoric of just trying to defend and decouple? Would that be the broad message? 
to an academic who's kind of working on China, sitting in India or the US, because the message seems to be similar. See, I think there's more hope in India in the long run, even though the short run looks bleak. And I think there's less hope in the United States in the short run and the long run. Because look, in India, you are going to have to figure out a way to live with the Chinese. They are India's neighbor and you can't get rid of your neighbors and you can't move away from your neighbors. In the case of the United States, look, the problem with, I used to have a professor many years ago called Hedley Bull. His co-author was a guy called Martin Wright. And Martin Wright put it really well. He said, American international relations theory is a justification for American foreign policy. So what all American intellectuals and academics are doing is writing liberal international order, which is not liberal, which is not international, which is not an order. And they're talking unipolarity. Not one of them is willing to talk bipolarity. And if I was India, I would say, look, in the short term, we want bipolarity plus, which is bipolar plus influential countries like India. And in the long term, we want multipolarity. Now, the problem is you're going to have trouble persuading Washington because Washington's been the unipolar for 30 years. Why should it give up that position? And again, I go back to Kishore Mehbubani, who gets no respect in America, because why would you take a Singaporean seriously? You should take a Brit seriously or a German seriously. But Mehbubani said this, he said, no American president can go to the American people and say, bipolarity is coming and we have to share power with the Chinese. And look, the US took 6,000 casualties in Afghanistan and Iraq. That almost broke the country. Do you really think you can sustain a war with the Chinese? You can inflict damage, but they can inflict damage too. What does it do to your economic standing, which would be question number two? And question number three there would be that after two or three years, do you think the people of America are going to support this kind of thing? Right now, there is a real belief in America that if Biden pushes for a NATO engagement with the Russians, he's out. Because there's no stomach for that fight. Is there really a stomach for a fight with the Chinese? Is there really a stomach to defend Taiwan? And by the way, I, I'll say one thing to all of you, and I know this will hurt some people's sentiments. The Taiwanese are not the Ukrainians. In the 1990s, when the Chinese fired missiles over Taiwan, 30% of the country left for Europe and, uh, not Europe, sorry, for North America and Australia. And that was the rich 30%. Ukrainians fought. If you really believe that the Taiwanese will fight, uh, I'm skeptical. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Um, I think that's all the questions we had. Okay. Um, hey, sir, would you like to? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Rohin, and thank you, Professor Gupta. I think uh, it has been a very, very uh, engaging uh, discussion, and earlier you were very thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure all of us have benefited from listening to you. And I hope that we can have you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll just say one thing in closing. I value the fact that there is an Institute for Chinese Studies that tries hard to have an independent perspective because what worries me about the India of 2023 is we are losing different thinking and different perspectives on foreign policy. We just have one foreign policy 
which every think tank in New Delhi seems to subscribe to. And that was not the case 10 years ago. It was certainly not the case 30 years ago. So great. I'm glad that you carry on the good fight. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Hemant, uh, with your permission, I'd like to conclude the seminar. Yeah, please. So um, with that, we have come to the end of today's seminar. I would like to thank Dr. Amit Gupta and Dr. Hemant Atlaka for taking the time out of their busy schedules to hold a fascinating conversation. The discussion of America's China policy and its implications for India was as topical as it was thought-provoking. A recording of today's discussion will be available on the ICS YouTube platform. At the ICS, we have been conducting seminars every Wednesday for four decades, and information related to them is available on the ICS website and our social media. You can also follow our Twitter page and subscribe to our newsletter for regular updates. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alta. Thanks, Eman. Thanks, Amit. And thanks for that very nice tribute at the end to the ICS efforts. Really appreciate that. <laughs>